Well, thank you for coming. We're excited to be here at Spark Summit talking about some of our work. Um, I'm going to start by giving you guys a brief overview of the company that we work for since you may not have heard of it. It's a relatively small um, media tech company. I say relatively because we're talking like 350 people. They, we have sales, we have operations, and about two-thirds of our company is actually tech. The reason we have so many tech people is because we support a sort of legacy portion of the ad tech world. Uh, we work with big cable operators and we operate a two-sided business that um, basically we sell media na nationally and we buy it locally and so we have a lot of big data problems associated with how to actually execute those buys in a way that fulfills our clients needs and from a sort of business perspective we're essentially um, our ability to make money depends on our ability to essentially efficiently execute something that we promised well before we actually knew what it was going to take to deliver it. So we use forecasting and sort of optimal decision making strategies based on those forecasts in order to fulfill, fulfill our business. And so as a result, the company has sort of invested deeply in the data engineering and data science aspects of technology. Um, two and a half years ago, roughly, I started working with Caden and came online to start the data science team. And over the time working with Caden, we have gotten to the point now where our sort of data science team is a half dozen people, but we support um, dozens of engineers across different parts of the company, including um, the primary business that we're going to talk about today, but also some dynamic advertising insertion applications um, that are worked on out of our West Coast office. And so I'm going to sort of step into the problem we're going to talk about today, which gave rise to our high dimensional uh, learning problem, and that is TV ratings. Here's the thing. You've probably heard people talk about TV ratings before. Most people care about it in what I consider the weather sense, sort of what's going to happen tomorrow, what are the ratings on TV next week. And this is sort of people use Twitter data. They use, you can even use weather data to figure out what the ratings are going to be and what people are going to watch. We're actually taking a big step back, and we care about this problem from a climate-like perspective. And the reason is because we need to know what the trends are going to be like months from now. And in fact, that tends to be heavily seasonally driven. It tends to be, I mean, in many ways, like more like a climate model. You're looking at you know, averages over the whole month, and we're saying, well, OK, during this block of time on this TV network, um, during this month, how are the ratings going to perform sort of on average with respect to the type of ads that we are specifically going to get, not even just the general sort of Nielsen ratings, but actually the uh, what we call realized ratings, which are the, the average impressions that are generated specifically by our business process. And so um, with this, we get into our actual problem. And that is, for starters, almost all of the features that we have to deal with are specific to um, dimensions that uh, sort of repeat over lots and lots of records. And so we have these you know, day of the week month of the year sort of time series like features. We also have a bunch of high cardinality categorical variables like the TV network. And when push comes to shove, the thing that actually influences what the ratings are the most is actually what time of day it is during the individual day. And the result of this is that we have such astronomical feature importance on this single one value that minor variations in this will dwarf minor variations in any other feature. And we found that it's incredibly productive to just think of ratings as a day-long profile. So if you have sample data every 15 minutes, which is standard for Nielsen rating data, you actually have a 96-dimensional vector representing the day. And now that you've pivoted that one um, that one dimension out and described a vector, you actually have a much better conformed 
input-output relationship between your features and your labels, though admittedly we've constructed a vector value labeled. And if any of you are familiar with trying to do vector value regression in Apache Spark, you will know that you cannot do it. In fact, it's not supported in the MLlib uh, or in the ML API. I am assuming there's probably a good way to make it work in MLlib. We've done it primarily with the ML API through uh, the construct that we're going to talk about um, in our talk today. So our first operation is effectively this pivot, and by recognizing that ratings are better conformed as uh, vector labels. Um, so a quick look at what that sort of trends that implies. Um, this is a really, really high level view, but basically we have three types of things going on. We have high ratings, we have medium ratings and we have lowish ratings. These are, you know, this is a k-means just like general view of trends. But the thing that's important here is that we've laid out mean invariance as a vector that's twice as long and actually found that we have a pretty strong distinction in the amount of variance that's actually occurring in these patterns. So we, we have to have a model that can account for patterns that are high value, low variance, sort of medium to high value, high variance, and the worst of all, the low value, uh, high variance. These are just, you know, we still need to be able to discern some signal from the noise, but you can imagine that um, signals that have this character are actually quite difficult to predict. Um, the other note I have here is that the ratings tend to vary very, very geometrically, meaning that you'll see ratings vary from point 0.001 to 0.0001 and so on. And as a result, we actually find it's more intuitive to look at our results in this log space. It's not actually log space, it's a linear transform of a log of a linear transform, but it's custom designed to be um, sort of domain interpretable. Um, I made some notes here in the corner that essentially a zero value is zero, and as you go from zero to eight, you get closer to a rating of one, which is the sort of absolute max. It means everyone who could have possibly watched something watched it. Obviously, in practice, we don't achieve that. Peak ratings are actually more like uh, one one hundredth. And as you can see here in this uh, sort of grouped averages, the peak pattern is maxing out at about five which is equivalent to 10 to the negative three. So the next thing that we run into with our vector um, machine learning problem is the fact that, uh, well, simply put, you don't want to do 96 individual regressors. And so we actually have to do dimensionality reduction on our label space. And that's a tricky thing to get into because if you do dimensionality reduction, you're actually losing some information. Um, for us, it's not uh, the end of the world because we're still modeling in this sort of, um, well, big data environment. We have lots and lots of records, and in fact, there's more variance than we need to actually do our climate level model. So the small amount of variance that we lose by choosing to do a dimensionality reduction in our, um, in our label space is not actually influencing the overall behavior of our model. Um, but obviously we need to be aware that it can be, and there's an explicit trade-off between how many principal components you keep when you do this reduction and how genuine your representation of the data is. Um, one note I'd like to make is that because we're doing this sort of um, multi-regressor approximation of a um, n-dimensional regressor, we actually have sort of independent estimates of each of the values, and this dimensionality reduction technique also helps align the vector space that we're um, forecasting in so that the principal components are more perpendicular to each other, and this actually gives favorable mathematical properties, so much so that even if you were to not do this step, and you don't reduce dimensions with a PCA, you would actually still use the PCA because it'll give you a different coordinate system. And a uh, brief sort of, you know, zoom in on what's happening. I have a couple uh, examples in the upper left of sort of what a ratings day pattern might look like. It can be anything from, you know, appears to be more or less zero all day to a high spike in the evening or on a network that has heavy TV daytime programming like the Food Network. You see, you know, 
much higher values during the day. When we decompose these records, these profiles based on a PCA, we get these signals decomposed in these like sort of crazy vectors that seem like they're useless, but in reality the value that comes from them is that they are a sort of set of basis vectors for the space that our records actually live in, where um, the individual components themselves are least in dependent on each other. So it's, it's reducing collinearity. Um, to my point about the trade-off with regards to how many dimensions to keep, you know, it's a pretty standard procedure to have a look at the captured variance when you're using PCA as a uh, feature reduction technique. And so here we have a look at the overall trend and sort of zoom in on the part of the curve that has the sort of significant trade-off. And, you know, more or less, depending on your application, you make a decision about how much variance you need to capture relative to how many dimensions you want to keep. And I do always reiterate this warning when you use dimensionality reduction on labels, that you cannot get back what you've thrown away. Um, you have to use a pseudo-inverse operation to undo this, and you have to undo this in order to get back to your original label space and generate a prediction. Um, so, why is it that we're going to do this? Well, as I said before, we don't really worry too much about the smaller amount of variance that we're losing because we have this climate view in this, in this application. I wouldn't want to do this in an application where I was doing this sort of weather equivalent, where I wasn't taking this sort of very um, aggregated long view sort of let me predict the general pattern rather than predict the exact, um, the exact outcome. Um, and the other thing here is this starts to get into how this sort of fits with the spark problem. If, um, if you do this in the way that we're going to talk about and Stefan is going to get into the details of, you are literally doing one regressor in a pipeline for every dimension you keep. So in an ideal setting, you have a parameter j, which is the number of dimensions you keep in your label space, which is much less than n, where n is the original dimension. And doing this actually greatly reduces the sort of computational cost of doing this n-dimensional regression because you just have that many fewer models to train. Um, and so I'm going to sort of take a sidebar to talk about a few of the other things that go on in our model just so that um, when we talk about the details uh, we don't lose anybody on anything. So we, we actually care a lot about coordinate systems. Um, if you notice, my discussion of the PCA really focuses on the coordinate systems. And so I wanted to give an example of how coordinate systems matter a lot. Machine learning has this fundamental assumption that things are similar if they are close in Euclidean distance. And sometimes the natural representation of the data doesn't have that property. And we can do both feature and label engineering in ways that sort of cause our statement of the problem to have this property. And so my favorite example is time, because inherently, you know, that's, what's that, 11.59 and midnight are actually very close to each other. But if you have values that go from, you know, zero, even if you've corrected for the fact that minutes only go to 60, they're far. If you map to the unit circle, you get back this property that these points are close. And as a, as a free um, bonus, you also get the fact that you can impute values you don't know at 0, 0, and they're equidistant from every point. So uh, this is just intended to sort of say, OK, why do we care about coordinate systems? And um, the more detailed thing that we did with coordinate systems is this custom log-like transformation that I alluded to earlier. Um, we implemented this because we were running into challenges with um, interpreting when our model was correct. Um, by default, in an environment where variations, um, the actual labels range from 10 to the negative fifth or sixth, all the way up to 10 to the negative 2, you, your model gets swamped by the larger values, right? Even huge relative errors on the small values don't contribute much to the like, classical error metrics like a mean absolute error or 
um, a mean squared error. And so you have to change coordinate systems so that Euclidean distance in this coordinate system is a good measure of error. And in particular, we use this, um, this coordinate system which maps our ratings which were previously distributed on this log scale to being distributed nicely where our zeros are well captured in a, a big bucket and then we have a nice distribution representing the values from 10 to the negative, roughly two up to slightly more than 10 to the negative six. And um, so we probably won't talk about this too much, but if you see some of our plots have values between 0 and 8 as opposed to values between 0 and 1, it's because those values are drawn from this coordinate system, which we created specifically for better understanding the errors in our model. And then, so sort of the last part of the theory and math part of this talk is that we implemented a sort of special type of ensemble that we created um, based on some concepts from um, basically from numerical programming and analysis around uh, approximations of derivatives and such. You can effectively predict and correct your prediction by creating a predictor that's first purpose is not necessarily to be super accurate, but has sort of well-conformed properties. You create a new label, which is the error of your first predictor, and then you predict that error. You can put it back together, and you get an overall prediction. So this is a, an ensemble that we call a predictor corrector, and in this case, we, uh, we used it simply because we were having some issues with um, sort of our first predictor having highly structured error, and we had a lot of difficulty figuring out what was causing the structure in that error, and turns out if you have highly structured error, it might be easier to just machine learn how to correct for it than it is to actually manually figure out what you need to change in your model to make that structured error go away. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn over to Stefan who's gonna talk about what we actually implemented. Um, and sort of the details of how these set of tools were implemented in Apache Spark. Thank you, Mike. Well, uh, let's uh, look into some details of our uh, predictor corrector model implementation. Uh, this uh, flowchart that you see here uh, basically represents the training phase of the model. And uh, as you see, there are a lot of steps and they're quite complicated. So I'm not getting into detail about this. Uh, each step, but uh, suffices to say that uh, it's generally comprised of the naive estimator model in the, do in the domain space, uh, the correction estimator model in the lock-like space, and we have a PCA space reduction and inverse uh, PCA transformation to get back to uh, the original domain space. So the, the core problem we face is, as uh, Mike mentioned, the fact that our uh, labels are vectors instead of just single double values. So we, uh, had, we decided to work around this by creating a pipeline of regressors. But in order to do this uh, feasibly, we first had to uh, use PCA transformation for reducing the space to J-sized vectors. Then we used the uh, vector disassembler which in some of the next slides I'll show some code examples, uh, to basically create uh, columns for each of the component of the uh, J-size vector. Then we apply the pipeline to predict each one of these uh, labels separately. Then we use vector assembler to compose back the J-size vector and uh, um, the inverse PCA to get back to our uh, original domain space. And uh, now there are a couple of slides showing uh, some code examples. And uh, in this one, you can see uh, our inverse uh, PCA function and UDF created, um, basically preserving the principal matrix from the uh, PCA model and use it to multiply our uh, uh, vector, the short size vector to get uh, back the original size, the 96-dimensional. And the uh, code snippet at the bottom of, this, uh, of the slide shows uh, the usage of this UDF in SQL. <coughs> uh, there's some more functions that we used here, uh, like um, in this case, the vector disassembler, which wasn't available out of the box. 
And um, you can see on the bottom left is the gradient boost and decision tree uh, model. And then uh, we create a, an array of pipeline stages and populate it with, all, with basically the number of, uh, mod, uh, of models that correspond to the uh, components in our lower dimensional uh, vector. So uh, another step in the whole process is to do some evaluation of our model. And this is just an example of one of the dashboards that we came up uh, to help us evaluate that. To, to create this kind of dashboards, we also faced some uh, challenges. So this slide actually um, focuses on some of these challenges. This is basically our big data results are 96 dimensional, as already was mentioned. But uh, in uh, Spark ML, evaluators like estimators are uh, one dimensional. So we had to unpivot uh, this data frame and create, uh, in this case, the example is three columns like predicted ratings, original uh, actual ratings, uh, errors. We, if you want to capture some intermediate uh, values, you can have uh, um, several more columns. It's just uh, the choice of. Uh, what we are evaluating. Uh, but basically, this has the effect of uh, blowing up the data frame significantly. And we have to come up with some kind of small data artifacts. Because uh, contrary to the small data analysis, when you can just uh, try to visualize things, here we had to um, come up with something that's small enough to be um, collected to the driver in order to use visualization tools like Tableau or uh, um, any, any other Power BI, any other visualization tool that you can connect Seaborn. Um, so it's a, either, we, either we do sub-selects on random values or we uh, um, aggregate things. Uh, uh, collapsing uh, values that we don't care about to get uh, values that we actually care for. So uh, again, after this, there are a couple of slides showing code examples uh, on uh, basically here, this slide shows the steps that we are following in order to ensure the performance quality of, of our model. We have UDF composition and data wrangling, as we call it, and uh, uh, machine learning evaluation. So. Here, like it was uh, well known that uh, the vector classes in Spark machine learning are uh, uh, not, uh, they're basically targeted to, for data representation, not for uh, arithmetic operations. So we uh, used Breeze library to do some linear algebra, and uh, we ended up creating a set of uh, helper functions. Uh, some of the examples of this you can see here. It was very useful to have like uh, element-wise calculations on vectors. And uh, here we have an example of uh, zip and flatten relevant on vectors. In this particular example, um, you have uh, four vectors that are input here. If you recall the slide, we had created three columns, but basically, uh, this is something that you have to adapt to the number of uh, columns that you need to uh, track down and, uh, uh, in the evaluation process. You can change it to two or three or four or five. Uh, this is what we call data wrangling, which we basically use the previous functions to uh, come up with a data frame that has the data that we need. Um, here it's used, used uh, post-explode is used, but uh, in some other versions, we used flat mapping to achieve a singular purpose. <coughs> and uh, another useful uh, functions here are, are pivoting and aggregating for uh, getting summary statistics. And uh, I have to, probably this is the right point to mention that a lot of this code was contributed by our colleague Joshua, who is here to answer uh, tough right questions if you, have, <laughs> if you have tough questions on the code. Um, and uh, with this, we come back to basically uh, showing uh, what stays behind creating this kind of, uh, of dashboards to help us evaluate the models. And uh, 
With that, I'll uh, pass the problem back to Mike to talk about our future work. Um, so I motivated this by talking about sort of the climate view of ratings forecasting problems. We actually also do have interest in the shorter term view of the problem, though, because we're operating over our unwired cable network where the decision making is occurring still in these sort of weeks lead time and not on the instantaneous time frames that you normally run into with sort of digital based ad tech applications, we still don't get quite into the time scale where you can use methods that are based on like Twitter trends and whatnot. And actually our shorter term refinements are based on um, mostly programming data. So programming schedules are released five weeks before the actual airings. And so we can do sort of a extended forecast view of ratings in the intermediate term and use that to inform our ordering decisions. So uh, current work that's going on now is based on using those data sets to take our sort of initial climate data models as predictions of the general trends and do sort of conditional updates that say, OK, now given some information that's become available on a shorter time frame, how can I update or create a you know, midterm view of what's going to happen? And I think it's been kind of fun for us to have a version of a problem that has been studied, but a different version of it. So it makes it a more challenging problem than just go find what other people have done and apply it. It's a take the specific context of our problem and come up with a custom solution that works well for us. Um, another thing that we've been doing is extending our view of TV ratings beyond Nielsen, which is inherently set based on um, like survey data. It's, it's based on sample sizes and aggregations and basically, you know, population and sample statistics. And Rentrack, on the other hand, is a completely different source. It's census level data. Um, it's provided by a different third party data provider. And in fact, it has a lot of differences in the way that its um, features are defined. And so um, there's a non trivial um, problem of representing the characteristics of the records in a way that works for both. But ultimately, you have two um, what I would call sort of independent observations of the same underlying phenomenon. And if you know much from like sensor fusion, that's a really good way to get a better estimate, right? Having largely uncorrelated observations of the same phenomenon through different sensors, even if those sensors have different dynamics, can actually help with your estimation of the true value in both cases. And in particular, when you want to forecast, you're doing sort of this problem of, I want to know the true behavior of this because the, um, the behavior that's going to be realized is some, it's going to be some noisy version of an underlying pattern. And we can identify that underlying pattern more accurately if we have multiple ways of observing it. And so actually, Stefan has been working on the ingestion and integration and confirmation of the rent track data in a way that makes it sort of possible to interpret as um, sort of independent observations of the same underlying phenomena. So to wrap up, we'd like to just sort of call out Josh as another major contributor of this project and um, just sort of thank our broader team. As I mentioned, Caden is a um, roughly 350 person company. About two thirds of it is the tech org and um, so we have a lot of people doing a lot of different projects within the data space. And while we've talked to you specifically about one that we've done with our engineering research team based in Philadelphia, we have ongoing data science and engineering problems being tackled by our BI team, by our San Jose based development team, and also um, our sort of Philadelphia based development team. Um, and uh, all of our team members sort of share knowledge and work together and enable the use of engineering programming expertise, mathematical expertise, and domain expertise to collectively come up with sort of specific solutions that help us run our business. And we'd also like to thank Databricks, to be honest with you, prior to moving onto their platform, we had a lot of difficulty with um, sort of wrangling our Spark clusters in such a way that we could get research time that wasn't being interrupted by keeping our clusters running and um, sort of debugging whatever problems arose with the infrastructure. So this has made a huge difference in how quickly we could iterate through our research projects.
Uh, so thank you very much. And I think we have time for questions. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Let's go ahead. That was awesome. Definitely the most technical talk that I've seen so far today. But yeah, let's take a couple moments for, for some questions. I get to do the running around now. Okay. So what different ML methods did you try for your problem? Um, do you mean in the sense of machine learning uh, algorithms within? Um, well, we started with uh, random forests. We Slid to gradient boosted trees, but to be honest with you, um, given the problem that we're solving, uh, we just don't find that the performance gains between methods make a huge difference, and we prefer to use our research time sort of figuring out the outer method than worrying too much about the inner methods. One of the great parts about um, decision tree based ensembles is that they're actually really, really tolerant of meta-parameter selection, right? Like, you, you get a pretty good answer without a whole lot of effort to optimize your meta-parameters. In, in problems where we have the resources and the time to really dig in and we need a really precise answer, it makes sense to move to um, methods that have more sensitivity to their meta-parameters, but also, as a result, you can sort of achieve higher peak performances. Um, but that really boils down to your business trade-off, right? Like, time to value of being more accurate. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this application, actually, we a we're actually pretty tolerant of losing some variance in the long-term view. It's more important that we get the overall trends right, which is non-trivial, than it is that when we do get it right, that we get it right you know, to you know, an extra order of magnitude. Yeah, thanks. Uh, cool presentation. I really appreciate how you uh, took care of the features and you kind of kept, kept track of how to always interpret the features throughout all your transformation. That was really cool. So I have two questions. One is, uh, I've noticed that gradient boosted trees takes a long time, so I'm wondering what, what is your timing for producing this, um, these predictions? And the other question is, I saw that uh, you have like fairly complex pipelines, so I'm wondering if you have to extend the pipeline class so that you kind of generate multiple data sets, or I'm sorry, data frames, or you had to input multiple data frames? Well, the, the, the first question, the, the time that it takes, uh, I find it, uh, where was this? No, it was here. I found it uh, for um, processing like a, a year worth of data that we have. Um, on a 120 node cluster, uh, Databricks cluster, with uh, regular worker nodes, which regular, they're like the memory optimized all type of nodes. Now they're called uh, R2, R2X large, I believe. Basically, they have uh, 30 gigs of uh, memory and four uh, cores. With those, just having a bigger uh, driver, um, the, the whole model was taking uh, a little bit more than an hour, so it's not bad. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that, with that uh, speed. Uh, like, we had some, to compare, some old models that run on a much smaller set of data, on a, like a single machine, a powerful machine, but like on-premise uh, machine, and that uh, takes a day or more, I believe. Yeah, it's a it's slightly like, different implementation. A similar structure has the predictor corrector built into it, but it is uh, some of the, the, the first implementation of, of this predictor corrector based method had um, basically a partition across some of the main categorical variables and solved an individual model for each combination. And that led to a model that actually individually could run in you know, a few minutes, but once we did all of the combinations, it actually ran for a whole weekend. Okay. Uh, the second question was related to what, how we build a pipeline, I believe? Correct? Yeah, so, uh, in fact, uh, we uh, in, instantiate as many, like, uh, in a kind of a loop, as many uh, gradient boosted uh, regressors as are the steps in the pipeline, which actually match our lower dimensional vectors in 
The naive estimator case was five that we run with, and uh, in the correction estimator was uh, J was 12. And we build a pipeline and run it with those. So that's actually uh, what I told you about the response time. That's included in what I told you about the response time. Does this answer the question or is? Okay, okay cool. I think with that we'll call it. Let's give them one more round of applause and uh, thanks so much. Thank you.